Before we start, I would request that you turn your cell phones off and uh, please don't tweet and text during the lecture. I want to thank our sponsor, Gazette Newspapers, that makes this lecture series possible. Tonight, it's a great privilege to welcome Dr. Ken Bissler, who is going to discuss Fukushima nuclear power plant meltdown and its impact on the ocean, marine life, and th any threats to human beings. Ken got his BS from UC San Diego with a major in biochemistry and cell biology, and he got his PhD from the MIT Woods Hole Joint Program, and he got it in marine chemistry. He grew up in Minnesota, then he went to Southern California, then went to Holland to go to high school, and for a number of other reasons, came back to uh, Southern California, and then he's been at Woods Hole, which is on Cape Cod in Massachusetts for the last decade or, or more, I guess. Is that? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ken is a senior scientist of marine chemistry and geochemistry at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. He specializes in the study of natural and man-made radionuclides in the ocean. He organized the first international oceanographic expedition to Japan following the Fukushima disaster. And he created OurRadioactiveOcean.org. It's a citizen science sampling program that is in which citizens go out and collect water samples along the West Coast to analyze, for him to analyze in his lab at Woods Hole. The results of his analysis are posted on OurRadioActiveOcean.org and they're accessible to anyone who's interested in what these measurements show. Dr. Bessler has served as chair of the Marine Chemistry and Geochemistry Department at Woods Hole, executive scientist of the U.S. Joint Global Ocean Fluxes Planning and Data Management Office, and two years as an associate director of the National Science Foundation Chemical Oceanography Program. In 2009, he was elected fellow of the American Geophysical Union, and in 2011, he was noted as the top cited ocean scientist between 2000 and 2010 by Times Higher Education. He currently directs the new Center for Marine and Environmental Radioactivity at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. When you leave, we want you to pick up one of these cards that will tell you how to get to his uh, website and look at these data. And um, if all, there are a lot of activities, as you can tell, going on at the aquarium tonight. There's a corporate event going on out in the, in the Great Hall, and they have the Ocean Science Center reserved. Otherwise, we would in, have invited you in to see the Science on a Sphere experience that had its world premiere this morning about the topic that Ken is going to talk to you about. It's going to show several times a day in the Ocean Science Center, and I hope you will all come back and see it. And I also, if you behave yourselves and don't tweet or Twitter or let your cell phones ring, I'm told that we are all invited up to the veranda and there's a ukulele festival going on up there. And so uh, we'll, after, we'll go up and face the music after this lecture. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ken Bissler. Well, thank you for that introduction. I'm certainly very pleased to be here uh, trying to distill four years of research effort and 30 years of my career into about 40 minutes and hopefully time for questions here about what was going on and really two stories in Japan four years ago as a consequence of the earthquake and tsunami and then meltdown at Fukushima Daiichi, the nuclear power plant. So the first part of my talk is really reviewing a bit of what happened in Japan on the Japanese side. Uh, the picture on the right is a research vessel that we were able to charter and bring to Japan within two and a half months of that accident to look at the first response, which isotopes were there, what happened. And then the second part is more about, this looks fuzzy up close, but uh, a crowdfunding effort to really look on our coastlines on the west coast of uh, North America up to Alaska and Hawaii, what the levels might be, and that was done through a crowdfunding effort. 
So we'll get into both of those topics and hopefully have time for questions to get into this. And as Jerry said, there are ways for you to get more information too by going to these sites. So let's get a little bit more into my background. He did introduce me quite well, but I do like to point out when I was uh, a student in ocean sciences in 1986 is when I was finishing a degree on plutonium in the North Atlantic Ocean. Now plutonium, I think of where that come from, that was the legacy of weapons testing, atmospheric testing that peaked in the 60s, distributed worldwide a number of these human-made, man-made radionuclides, things like plutonium, cesium we're going to hear about, and strontium. So that was my field of study, my research study. 86 was also the year that Chernobyl occurred. So that accident occurred, and I started to do working work in the Black Sea. So I decided to stay on. I was the student they never got rid of uh, because I found it immensely interesting to then track the newer releases and what their fate was, what was going on in the Black Sea as a consequence of that accident. Now that was 25 years before Fukushima. I actually got out of that line of work for a number of years. I thought that was over. It would never happen again. Well, as we know, something did happen of equal magnitude. Uh, and then before I go on and talk anymore, I'll just show you what my beach looks like, by the way. I come from outside of Boston. This is four days ago. This is sand covered by snow. That's ice on the ocean. Uh, quite a different climate, and we could have a whole talk about climate change and CO2 and the ocean's role, because that's a lot of what I do is look at the ocean's role in climate and carbon uptake. But we'll skip that and just go on and say hi to my dog there on the beaches of Falmouth. So it's a pleasure to be here for a number of reasons. <laughs> and then this slide. I put in because I was talking the other day at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla, and I actually didn't fully appreciate that back 59, 60, and 61, one of their scientists had actually measured cesium at the same place where we started measuring it last year. And so what this graph is, I try not to have too many graphs, but to me, historically, this is important, to look at how much cesium-137, that's an isotope that was delivered by those same weapons that delivered plutonium, was going up and down at the pier in these years. They had weird units. I'm going to try and stick to one unit called a becquerel, the amount of decays per second. We'll get into that per volume of water. And remember the number eight, the biggest number they saw back then, the amount of cesium was eight in the years. And that was in the peak of the testing in the 60s. That's in the ocean. These were early studies. I'm a bit jealous, actually, because of how many data points they have on here. This was actually a large line of research funded in the US at that time, actually no longer. So we wanted to know a year ago how much was off Scripps Pier and could we see anything from Fukushima. So I'm going to give you the punchline of my talk and then I'll get into more detail. But the red dots are from 2014. Actually the first one's December 13, February 14, April, June, August. We have another one here. It's about two in those same units. So the punchline we'll get to is that what we're seeing today is certainly much lower than what we saw in the 60s. That number was much higher, actually, in other parts of the ocean. But we'll get to that a bit more. But I just want to put this in perspective. This has been looked at before. We're not the first ones to measure cesium. And what we're measuring are levels that are lower than what was experienced back in this era of nuclear weapons testing on our coastline. I am going to show you how high that was near Japan. So what happened? There was a magnitude 9 earthquake offshore. There was about 45 minutes later a wall of water, a tsunami wave coming up to the coast of Japan. This is looking out from Fukushima Daiichi, the nuclear power plant, at that wave, which doesn't look that impressive, but this is about 30 feet high, 10 meters wall that was supposed to protect the reactor that we're looking out from, from something like this ever happening. This is 50 feet tall. It's certainly easily crossed over that wall, went up. You can see these big oil tanks. They're basically backup power for the nuclear power plant. is fueled by these. The generators were at the same level as these cars that are being tossed around. And there was a complete loss of power both on land and then backup power at this reactor. Nuclear reactors need cooling, not only when they're producing power, but in this case, it had been shut down right automatically, actually, after the or when it, even before the earthquake shock hit, they shut down. The control rods were automatically put in the reactor. But there's a lot of fuel rods in these reactors that need to be cooled at all times. So things were 
already looking pretty bad early on, shortly after that tsunami hit because of the loss of power. How could they keep them cool? What would happen if they didn't? And we're going to show you some consequences. I first want to show this. That went too quickly. Uh, there were six reactors. This is four of them at the site. And these are before and after images of what goes on. Uh, this is a few days later because they've already had explosions. And so destructions of the buildings, not the primary containment, but what's called secondary containment. And that's the consequence of that tsunami. So here it is again, before and after. Uh, I also want to point out, though, that the immediate threat and concern, and to this day, the loss of life, was from the tsunami. Went by again too quickly, but basically 20,000, 16 to 20,000 people lost their lives or missing. Uh, huge areas of that coastline were complete devastation. Uh, when we were there, you, know, you can see obliterated whole neighborhoods. I'm sorry. Uh, quite, you know, the scene that I saw was something like a, a tornado had gone through, but it just went on for miles and miles. Uh, total devastation, over 100,000 buildings. So at the same time they're dealing with this loss of life and destruction, they now have an out of control situation, a nuclear power plant. So a very difficult time. They're starting to recover, of course, from this. They're still suffering from ongoing activities at Fukushima Daiichi that will take decades really to clean up. But we should not forget the tsunami and the damage and the loss of lives that Japan faced at that time. So when you overheat a reactor, you can start creating a meltdown situation. Things get very hot. The fuel cladding and the fuel rods start to melt down and melt through the base. That releases gases, including hydrogen, that are explosive and radioactive compounds, things that are either gaseous or come out during that fire, that high temperature like cesium. And that releases what we call fallout or atmospheric deposition mid-March. Notice here it's drawn over the ocean because thankfully most of the winds blow this offshore, not the entire time, but over 80% of the atmospheric deposition went into the ocean. At the same time, thanks to the heroic efforts of the Japanese on site, they were able to cool down the reactors, but it took a few weeks. And so a couple weeks later in April is when we had the peak water discharge that was contaminated coming from these reactors. And that's due to trying to maintain cooling so it didn't get worse. This could have been much, much worse. Uh, so they were able to stop the additional release by adding water, but of course that flows back into the ocean. So those are the largest sources. I'll show in the next slides how large. The other two places you might find the isotopes from Fukushima are through rivers. When you put fallout on land, some will come back out, and through groundwater. And to this day, uh, Japanese scientists, our group, goes back and looks at these to see how much is coming out from weathering of these rocks and soils or from groundwater, either distant or actually at the site, what's coming through the site. And we do active research on that. So to get a little more specific on how much is there, I'm going to do the comparison. And in fact, the very first publication I did was looking at data with a Japanese scientist. And he wasn't allowed to publish with me because we were making comparisons between Fukushima and Chernobyl. And in his position in the government lab, they said, that's not allowed. Well, it's an obvious thing to ask. And I'm going to ask it by looking at cesium-137, this isotope with a 30-year half-life. It stays around for a while. And compare what we put in from the weapons testing, about 1,000 of these units, 85, and somewhere from 15 to 60. So I would say this is about 10 times bigger than the other two accidental sources. This is adding up all of the testing by the Soviets, the US, French, Chinese, uh, UK. And it's in strange units. It still is a Becquerel, this one decay event per second. Radioactive decay is what we're measuring. It's a very small unit, so these are very big amounts. A petabecquerel is 10 to the 15, one with 15 zeros. And so this is a lot of cesium relative to, well, it was not there before. We introduced this. Uh, but these, I think, are comparable. The difference is we're trying to show <clears throat> that Chernobyl was about 80% deposited on land, about 20% in the ocean. You flip that around for Fukushima, it's mostly in the ocean, actually more than 90% when you add up both sources. Uh, and those numbers, four years later, I really can't tell you what the right number is. Since it went in the ocean, since it took a, a while to respond, actually, 
and I don't think we sampled adequately in the ocean, we still don't know the total releases, and that holds for something like cesium and other isotopes as well. Uh, Three Mile Island, by the way, is a quite a small number relative to any of these, really insignificant in terms of what was released from that meltdown. Uh, but I do want to point out what people don't also appreciate is my challenge as a marine radiochemist is there's a lot more natural radioactivity, isotopes that come from weathering of rocks and things that enter our ocean, potassium-40, 15 million in the same units. So I'm trying to measure a small amount of cesium in a radioactive sample because it has potassium-40, uranium-238, 37,000. These are also big numbers, by the way, because they've added up the entire ocean, how much is there together. We're going to look at how much is in each quantity in the next slide, how much is there per liter or per cubic meter. But no matter how you look at it, there's a lot more natural radioactivity in the ocean than what we've introduced. That's particularly good news in some sense. But the bad news was what was going on in Japan in 2011, 2012. Uh, I'll try not to have too many graphs here, but I really want to emphasize numbers now because we have a unit of a becquerel per cubic meter. It's about 160 gallons of water. And how much cesium is in that water measured in a unit of a decay event per second? It used to be about two. That's the number I saw today off of the coastline. It might have been eight. The highest levels we saw after Chernobyl were about 100 to 1,000. And so we had to use this logarithmic scale, which jumps way up here, to about 50 million becquerels per cubic meter. I'd never seen this. I was getting phone calls. Uh, people say, what does it mean? Well, this is a very high number. This is a level that which, if an animal, a marine system was living in there, would have direct effects, uh, reproductive effects, uh, mortality. Uh, you kind of see it going up. That's because of this addition of water that was going, leaking back into the ocean and fortunately going down. Uh, and that's because they plugged a lot of the holes. These are buildings and basements and turbines and connections that are now flowing into the ocean. You can plug some of those holes. That's what they did quite successfully and got back to levels within a couple of weeks of about 10,000. I should have pointed out this is right at the reactor, as close as you could get, but in the ocean. And each dot is someone going out there and collecting a sample. So many, many measurements released by TEPCO, the company that <coughs> uh, operated and is now decommissioning these reactors. And in some ways alarming and in many ways believable. Uh, they gave their techniques that made sense uh, that an accident of this magnitude might do this, and they were very happy with the decrease uh, over time. <clears throat> Excuse me. What you also notice, so I drew a blue line through the decrease, is it didn't keep going down, it actually started to level off, and that's about the time, looking at their results, that we were saying, this thing is still leaking. This is not back to one or two. It still has an effect on the ocean, and to this day, Somewhere between 100 and 1,000 is the level at that same sampling point at Fukushima Daiichi were we to extend this out. I do want to point out some of the other confusion, though. This is a small unit of radioactivity. So if you ask the U US EPA how much can we have in our drinking water, they would say 7,400 in the same units. It's a very uh, small amount of radioactivity that was there already. This is considered a human health concern. Reactors have operating limits. They became below the limit that they were allowed. But as I'll show you later, I'm still concerned around in here. Maybe not that the organisms will die or be affected directly, but if we were to eat seafood, swimming, growing in these waters, that we might internalize cesium and therefore have health effects. And we'll look at the seafood data shortly. So even though it might be below some regulatory limits, there are other reasons to want to know about this, what was going on. Uh, one slide from our cruise there in uh, the first two weeks of June. And I'm going to switch to cesium-134. So I have a, two isotopes, things that decay. They're the same chemical properties. Cesium is a salt. It dissolves in the ocean. will move with ocean currents, and I'll show you those currents. But how much was there really varies. You can see big spots and low spots. We started out here. We went from Tokyo went to what we thought would be the cleanest waters and moved our way back in, still waiting for permission to get these samples. There's a lot of stories about how could we have gotten this together so quickly. It was very difficult to get permission to come in close at that time. <clears throat> we got permission. We saw some high points near several thousand. The 134 
is a short-lived isotope, only lasts about two years before half of it's gone. It can only come from Fukushima Daiichi. So the only reason we see 134 in any place is because of that. And we see highs and lows. What's going on? Why is that? Well, that's our job as oceanographers. We were looking at this ocean current in particular and how it might affect the distribution of cesium. And we came to the conclusion that a lot of the waters that were released earlier had stayed near shore in what's called an eddy. And I'll show you a model of the currents that might manipulate this and change this. So we had a distribution, a range now up into about 4,000, 5,000 of these units is what we were seeing, about 30 kilometers uh, offshore, 18, 20 miles at that time in early 2011. Again, not eight, not four, not two. And this is the model that might explain a little bit why it looks so patchy. Uh, I describe this as being kind of snaky. What this is showing you is Japan and a release on the coast, how it would look if it moved with ocean currents offshore. The red spot is one of these ocean eddies, so that's why it's high. And the entire shape of this is driven by the larger scale ocean currents. The arrow here is describing the flow of water, how fast for the Kurashio on the east coast, we call this the Gulf Stream of the Pacific. It's a very strong ocean current that moves water very quickly offshore. This is only one month later. And you'll also see this characteristic decrease uh, by a factor of 10,000 between levels here and offshore. So we're always going to see lower numbers, but you're going to see quite a bit of variability. And that causes a lot of confusion uh, in terms of what you might be exposed to at that time, what was going on. So I want to get now more to the food webs, the, the fish and what they might experience. And so this is a little animation. We made it up very recently to describe the uptake of cesium, first in the lower part of the food chain, so through the plants and into the microscopic zooplankton. So the idea is when they're feeding, they take up these isotopes passively. It's potassium, it's a salt. Gets into both phytoplankton, zooplankton. We're going to see a little fish here come along eat some of those zooplankton, it will receive a certain amount of cesium and then a big tuna coming along which might consume that fish. Now, unlike some isotopes or things like mercury that you may have heard of, the concentration factor, the bioaccumulation for that microscopic plant is about a factor of 20 enrichment, maybe 50. It's about the same at each level of the food chain, slightly higher in some fish and some species, but not a lot of biomagnification. So in that sense, we're lucky with this isotope. It's not the same for everyone, but we don't get a lot of biomagnification. I get asked that a lot. But it is in all of those parts of the food chain. It also ends up both by consuming fish or just taking in water in things like tuna that can actually move away. And so we're going to watch what happens when this tuna swims now across from a contaminated area. And the feature is, just like any electrolyte in our system, salts, the amount, we're going to see a color change that indicate that it's losing cesium along the way. And by that, I mean we take in salt, we pee out salt. The same with fish. It's not a particular isotope that accumulates in a target organ. <coughs> about half of the cesium is lost in about two months as it swims across. In fact, the scientists who were, uh, did this, uh, Nick Fisher, Dan Madigan, we're using this kind of as a clock to see how long it took them to swim. That's actually a very interesting science question. But they were looking, and now we're going to look at data. How high did it get off Japan, and what does it look like on our coastline for the amount of cesium still left in those fish? Oops, we should just move ahead. So we'll look first at some of the most contaminated fish with the bottom dwelling fish, things here like flounders, cods, uh, greenlings. And we're going to look at just data from the prefixture, it's called the area around Fukushima. And we're going to now add up how much cesium becquerels in per kilogram of fish. So how much cesium in fish, low numbers, 100, 10,000 if you can't see them. A dashed line in the middle is what's allowed in seafood in Japan. Anything above that would be deemed, be deemed not uh, able to be put on the market. They actually changed that number, but we can get into that later. They lowered it. Uh, but this is 2011, 2012. You see many of these above and below the line uh, on any given day for this type of fish. 
high in the bottom dwelling ones, not going down. So I showed you a cartoon where it should go down if the water is cleaner, if you swim away. Another indication that there's still a source at the site. There is some additional cesium being added, or we'd expect these numbers to be going down more rapidly. Now, they are going down in general, but from this type of data, Japan Fisheries has put together, we could say something about the continued sources near Fukushima Daiichi. Now, they collected many more samples than that. They go up and down the coast now collecting data, decide whether to open or close fisheries. Based upon this type of data, you would not allow fisheries in the area off Fukushima. You might allow it here in the south. You don't allow it in Ibaraki for this type of fish. And so this is being done all over Japan, tens of thousands of fish per year analyzed to determine whether they're above or below this area to close fisheries or not. Uh, when I go to Japan, I eat the fish. I'm not concerned because I've witnessed the act of there is, first of all, there's no fishing fleet left. There are no canneries because of that tsunami. And they've closed down these fisheries. They're not canning them up or shipping them off to somewhere else. There is no commercial fisheries left in those areas. It's a big loss for Japan. They are massive consumers of seafood. They appreciate local seafood the way we do. And for them, this is not only a financial but a cultural loss to have to keep these closed. But they're monitoring it very closely. Uh, they're monitoring. This is some of their data now looking 2011, 12, 13, 14. And this year, just to remind us that the numbers that are above 100, if you add all fish types, some that are less contaminated, is going down. So there are fewer fish today, so that's relatively good news. But still certain types of fish, like these bottom dwellers, that remain persistently high. So that's the story on the Japan side. Here's that same cesium and fish now looking, comparing Japan to our side of the ocean. And I'm going to just do averages. The average of all those bottom fish was about 100 on that graph in those early years. At that same time, there was less in tuna and salmon, but they're the migratory ones. They're the ones who might be concerned about swimming across to our side if we're consumers. Well, before Fukushima, we did not detect. We saw this gray, if you can see it, is the background, the cesium-137 that was already there. This one study I showed, talked about, had about 10 of these units, becquerels per kilogram uh, off San Diego on the bluefin tuna, the migrators of the sea, really. Uh, the Canadians haven't spotted any in their salmon catch or their freshwater fish. Uh, this is a very low number. And by that, I mean, you know, Japan allows 100 in seafood before they deem it unsafe for human consumption. And that really is an annual number. You're looking at people who might be eating contaminated fish every day for an entire year, what might be considered safe. We're down 10 times less than that. US limit is 1,200. We eat less fish. Japan used to be 500, and I thought that ratio might have been about right because they eat more than twice as much fish. But this is almost a political decision. Maybe in Q&A we can get into this. It's a, a risk estimate of how much you would tolerate in your seafood before you would say, yeah, that's unsafe. Uh, at the same time, these authors pointed out there are natural isotopes, polonium-210, that actually give you a higher dose effect than the cesium when it's down here at 10. Fish, I think, are a very healthy thing to be eating. If I ate that much tuna at that level to cause any sort of health effect from the radiation, you would have a bigger problem with mercury and other things. So uh, these are very low numbers and encouraging in terms of our health and safety on this side. I'm still concerned near Japan about uh, fish safety. And I do want to point out that in the news and the headlines, near the nuclear power plant, that's a pretty ugly thing. I don't think I'm going to eat it anyway, but there's seven 160,000 of those units were caught. Uh, I think that was in uh, winter of 2013. Uh, so right near the source, there still are fish being exposed to quite high levels. So these are averages. There are extremes, particularly right at that reactor. They're trying to put nets up to stop them. It's a very difficult thing to do. So this is something that will be of concern near that source for a long time to come. Let's switch gears a bit and go to I find this, this beautiful image of ocean currents provided by NASA to remind us, here's Japan, what happens when something gets put in the water here that moves with the ocean currents like cesium, how far will it get? So it's going to follow these snaky patterns, maybe form little eddies here and not move too far offshore. But the ocean currents are really the driver for 
what we're going to see on our coastline. And so scientists have made models for what that might look like. And here's one of them. And we're going to see a release here now on the scale of the entire Pacific, 5,000 miles, of how much season we might expect based upon a model. And I'll try and stop it after one year, over halfway across the Pacific. We've gone from these red colors down into the blues and greens, maybe 10 to 100. This is not data. Uh, this is a model, and, and something I like to say is, because I'm not a modeler, all models are wrong. Models are approximations. Uh, they may be useful. In this case, I think it was quite useful, but they're an approximation. So whenever I see these things, I want to get data to see how well it does, because how does that approximation fit the world? And we'll, we'll look at that a little bit. We'll go on, though. Oops. <laughs> We'll have to watch it again. There it is halfway. You know, it's going to be reaching our coast, say 2013. I was getting phone calls, 2014. Uh, low numbers is all I could tell people is what we might expect. One to 10, maybe 30 becquerels per cubic meter. Reaching our coastline, probably highest in the northwest first, lower down here later. But the ocean currents would be carrying the radioactivity across on these time scales three to four years. Something were to happen today it would take the same amount of time to reach us three or four years. And we can run these types of models into the future. But it really isn't sufficient for me anyway as a radiochemist to say, don't worry, be dismissive, because people do have health concerns. And we're not making measurements. The government wasn't measuring cesium with any method that would allow them to see 10, 100 of these becquerels per cubic meter. They were saying it's well below our safety standards. Let's not even bother. I really wasn't accepting of that, and I really felt compelled by a lot of questions to really do something that I've never done before, uh, which is ask for help from individuals, like in this audience. Can you come, propose a location where you want to sample, raise the money we need? We started a website, ourradioactiveocean.org, and even though Jerry said, turn off your cell phones at some point if you want to go online and make a donation, that would be just fine. Uh, the goal here is not just to get locations funded, I'm going to show you some data, but also to provide information. Uh, we show maps that show how much radiation was in the ocean before the accident. We talk about the uptake in the food chain, the health effects of different isotopes on the human body. So we've had a very good response to that. Uh, very pleased, in fact, with being able to show you this map. And I'll use it several times for the pictures, so we should step back and look. It's a beautiful image of ocean temperature. The colors are not radioactivity. Uh, it's water temperature here, warm in the south, cold in the north. This is the big gyre in the Pacific. Hawaiian Islands are down at the bottom. Every circle here, whether it's white or blue, is a location where, in this case, a family helped us sample and sent it back to Woods Hole. We analyzed it for cesium. Every single sample had 137 in it. That's the isotope that's always been here. This is an estimate of how much 134 was there. The white circles are ND, not detected, less than 0.2. So we have not seen it along this coastline from La Jolla up to Alaska and Hawaii. We did find some offshore. And last November, there was a headline about 100 miles off of Eureka. That's that blue dot there. So what we're seeing is transport across on these time scales but fortunately, very low numbers, very similar to that model, in fact, that I just showed you. Uh, and what we hope to do is continue to follow that as it continues to move inshore, just to reassure ourselves the numbers are low for the uh, human health perspective, the concerns, but also as an oceanographer to refine that model, do a better job next time. Uh, but what I've also learned is that you know, when people get engaged, it's really fun for me to see. You know, they take my sampling kits, they go out to a beach, they fill it up, they become engaged. They get the family involved. Uh, surfing organization Santa Cruz got the local radio station involved to do a little fundraiser to get the money to do that. We're still trying to uh, add to this over time. This is Santa Barbara. La Colina High School worked with the Natural History Museum there to get a class out there collecting one of our samples. So we're actually engaging people, and they can learn something about their environment, whether it's safe or not. I don't think it's as important as just getting them to look at their ocean in different ways and understand a bit more about the levels that were there and what might be coming. That's been quite uh, pleasing for me to see. I didn't have to do that. We just gave them a, a box and a container. 
It's also nice to see the diversity of funders from some small government grants, but mostly foundations, Suzuki Foundation, uh, a real estate group, some very big foundations, the Moore Foundation, uh, a nuclear society in Idaho, uh, a computer company in Falmouth that gives us little temperature probes we can put in with each sample. Uh, Pacific Blue funds the site in La Jolla. Uh, here's a fun one, the Guacamole Fund. I still don't know what they fund, <laughs> but they gave us some money. University of Hawaii, uh, Woodsole Sea Grad. But we get the range from you know everyone who's already decided they're for or against nuclear power. That's not the issue. It's to look at what's in the ocean. That's a separate issue. So I've been giving the same talk to a lot of different groups uh, because of this wide range of sponsorship. I think there's interest that's much more broad. I've also formed a new center. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I think there is a need to increase our literacy, our understanding of the different sources, whether it's potassium-40 or cesium or plutonium. And for that, it takes things like this event, uh, public outreach. I need to train a few more people so that someone's around <laughs> when they can give this talk in 25 years and promote the research and engineering. We're also producing literature in Japanese, so we translate our our products and, and deliver them to Japan and have websites. So Japan, of course, is the most concerned, rightly so. Uh, we're also trying to develop new tools, some really clever ways. I have a really great engineering group in Woods Hole that uh, outfitted a kayak. It's not the best view, but it's an autonomous vehicle being controlled uh, without anyone on board paddling along and collecting underneath it cesium samples. And the idea is to launch something to do more monitoring, say, off our coastline. Uh, there are vehicles like this that are powered by waves. This is actually powered by a jet ski motor, but we could put them in the water and maybe release them here and catch them up in San Francisco without me going out on a boat. <laughs> it's an expensive proposition, takes a lot of effort. And for some of this, we just need more data. I would love to have had these four years ago to put off the Japan coast to refine what some of those release estimates were. Uh, the latest one I'm really kind of excited about. We haven't gotten the lease, but there's a group in La Jolla that I met makes a smart fin uh, embedded in this surfboard fin is a temperature, GPS, salinity, pH, uh, accelerometers. And what I want to couple with that are ways to put little cesium absorbers on either the ankle uh, or back on a different fin. So I can collect not by using 50 uh, pound samples, five gallon samples, but by passively absorbing cesium onto something like this and having people ship it back to me, we could have hundreds of people up and down the coastline. It doesn't have to be surfers, but it just seems like a good target audience that gets in the water every day and has been asking me the same question, how safe is it to go surfing? What should we be concerned about? What levels? So I think there's some good things out there. All of these things take support, of course, and that has been the frustrating thing. The uh, government agencies aren't really motivated for health reasons to be doing much on this. I think they should be. Uh, and we're trying to find sponsors, usually private sponsors, to get behind some of these and help us uh, monitor better these ocean radioactivity levels. Uh, I've got a couple slides left just about the future. This is on that postcard. I just wanted to point out we're getting great collaboration. I don't want to forget my Japanese colleagues. This is Fukushima Daiichi, the reactor. This is about a kilometer, less than half a mile away. This these tubes close at different levels in the ocean to collect water that we analyze. We do check every sample with like Geiger counters to make sure we're not in harm's way. Uh, the workers here on land are being exposed to much higher levels of radioactivity than we are on the ocean. It may not seem like a great distance, but it's a big distance in terms of the amount of water that actually provides shielding and the amount of mixing that can go on between, you hear in the news, 300 tons per day leaking. That's true, but that's a lot more water that is being mixed into that we're sampling. So we have great access, but we're also uh, continually concerned about what's coming out of there. And one way to get that answer is to sit here in the ocean and collect samples. We try and go back at least twice a year as funding allows, and that will continue. And then I think it's like three more slides, but two with words. I often don't like doing this, but it's a very touchy subject, radioactivity. We're all concerned, and I want to make sure the take-home messages are clear. This is unprecedented. The amount of radioactivity that went in the ocean from that nuclear power plant, we have not seen as an accidental release. The impacts will always be higher, closer to Fukushima. By that, I'm thinking of health impacts, but we can have other ones. And earlier on, when you had those very, very high levels, 
and on land. When cesium falls on land, it attaches to the soil, it stays beneath your feet, it doesn't go anywhere. I showed you those movies with the ocean currents, but it falls in the ocean, the concentrations decrease and it moves away. So that's fortunate for us, unfortunately for the people on land. Uh, 100,000 people can't move back to their homes because they consider the radiation levels too high. And it will cross the Pacific. Those currents we know are there. What we're seeing so far are levels that are not zero, but similar to what we experienced in the 1960s from the earlier fallout test. Quite low relative to any sort of standard uh, for health and safety. This version is more of my concerns. What am I concerned about? What do I lose sleep about? I, I lose sleep about things like ongoing leaks, how much strontium-90, we haven't talked about it, but it's a different isotope with different health effects. Some that are of greater concern because it's a bone-seeking isotope that ends up staying in our systems much longer, years instead of two months. So that is preferentially, uh, have people heard of the tanks that they have? A thousand tanks of radioactive waste. Every day they're collecting water because groundwater goes into those buildings, becomes contaminated. They're putting it in a tank and they're trying to clean it up as they put it in. They only can take out the cesium right now, they're developing techniques to take out other isotopes, but there's more strontium-90 in all of those tanks there by a factor of 100 than whatever was released back in 2011. So we have concerns, something could go wrong today. They've had leaks, they've had people go out and find leaks with radiation detectors and get exposures that are you know, equivalent to thousands of chest x-rays just by being there. There is highly radioactive water still stored in thousands of tanks. Something has to be done. Uh, I often, my vision of this is uh, not to belittle, but it's like Fantasia and Mickey Mouse and, and you know, the Sorcerer's Apprentice and there's more water coming and more water coming. If you haven't seen it, you probably won't get this, but it's just an endless battle. They're gonna have to do something. They're gonna have to clean this up and maybe by that I mean extract something that's harmful and put it out of harm's way before they can release it. There's talk, I think, premature about releasing the water already because they haven't proven to me that they can do that effectively. But something has to happen. They just keep building up more and more water. Fish, it's not just enough to measure those fish. We have to do ocean sciences to look at the sea floor, the rivers, and the biota. Uh, and then the decommission itself, uh, the safety of the workers, the cost. We're talking uh, low estimates are $10 billion, high estimates $50 billion or higher. Uh, time 15 to 50 years. I think it's more the higher estimates for time. Uh, these people who can't return to their homes, uh, there's a difficult decision that needs to be made about what's safe. The fisheries that are still closed, all those families, the fishermen, people who can't eat their local seafood. So those are some things I worry about a lot. And then just the final slide to encourage you to come back. We have a really wonderful six minute video here that's gonna be shown here, hopefully at several of these 100 locations around the country in Japan when we translate it. So you can learn this, go through this whole lecture in like six minutes. This is a quick version, but I think it's quite effective. And I think Jerry and his group and my group at Woods Hole have done a nice job of putting that together. And so please do come back and watch that. And so I'll end there and take questions, Jerry, if you want. So before we go, Ken, in, in that Science on a Sphere video that, uh, you were the primary writer of. In, in the end, you compare what it would be like in terms of exposure to radioactivity if you went swimming every day in the ocean off here for a year relative to going to the dentist tomorrow to get my x-rays. Yeah. Tell us that. <laughs> so we took that number two that we measured off Scripps Pier. We said, well, it might go up to eight or 10. And we put someone and said, well, if you're swimming eight hours a day, every day of a year, what is that dose for the entire year? It comes out to something that was so small, I double checked it with a couple of people. It's about a thousand times less than a single dental x ray. So, a flight across New York to LA again would be a thousand times greater than this person swimming or surfing every day. That's why I think two, four, six, those numbers don't concern me. 20 million, yes, stop surfing. You know, if you're a fish, get out of those waters fast. 10,000, maybe don't eat the fish. But these low numbers are really low. It's not zero, and I don't want to trivialize the risk at all. There's always additional risk, but it's a very, very low number. So that's why when people ask me, am I concerned about swimming here? No. Am I concerned about eating your local fish? No. It's because these numbers are not zero, but they're very, very low. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm glad you're doing this research since there is no US government agency that is. 
But I'm a little concerned about the Woods Hole Institute because of how they are supported by both the Department of Defense and Department of Energy, both of who are heavily invested in the nuclear energy industry. And every time we see an article in the mainstream media telling us it's all good, uh, it's always you or someone from Woods Hole that is quoted. And I'd like to ask you in particular about a CBS News article from December 30th where you were quoted saying the cesium is being diluted, it's not a concern for us here. But then a Bradley Moran, who is from the White House, I believe, and did his postdoctoral work at Woods Hole, he was quoted saying there was, quote, no cause for concern, unquote, no health impacts. Isn't that a bit premature and possibly disingenuous, especially after you just said you're losing sleep about the strontium-90? Right, right. A lot of good points were put to forward there. Uh, responding to a few of them, I think, you know, this idea of no concern, there's never zero risk, so we always should be concerned. Uh, I do think we shouldn't be worried. The relative levels are just so obviously different, whether it's my data, so you question Woods Hole, Kelp Watch is doing this independently, uh, any other research lab that can't see it because they don't have our facilities. We're all seeing very, very low numbers here. We saw Japanese data, French data, very, very high numbers near Japan. So I think the data can't be questioned, no matter who's doing it, who's been funding it. Uh, the interpretation of that can be, and I think people are too quickly dismissive to say no, or the word safe. I try not to use the word safe, because that's really your decision, what you consider safe or not. I consider it very safe when those levels are so low on this coastline that I'm not gonna get a dose equivalent to, say, 1,000 x-rays that I voluntarily take. I'm not making a choice to do that. This has happened. So that's kind of my relative scale. And my health concerns always go towards Japan. So when people are looking for health effects, I think we're going to see them first and greatest in Japan than on our coastline. It's been exaggerated by both sides. We've been maybe too dismissive on the government side, maybe on the nuclear power industry side, but also I think exaggerating that people who are against nuclear power have every reason to hold that belief but they shouldn't scare people, in my opinion, from swimming off of Laguna Beach or Long Beach in these waters. Uh, hello. So I was just wondering if you could elaborate on how the government determines the amount of allowed dosage yeah. of cesium becquerel per kilogram in the fish. Because it seemed like it was kind of dependent on like the citizen's intake of fish, but I wasn't entirely sure. Well, like a lot of contaminants, think of even mercury, you know, the more you eat, the higher the risk levels. And so they set a number where they say if you're eating at this level every day at the average, you're going to have an increased chance of a health effect, cancer in this case. And I believe the numbers they're using, this is my specialty, are things like an additional 1 in 20,000. There's a lot of controversy about whether it might be 10 times higher for groups like children and females, which it probably is higher whether it's 10 times higher, five times higher. So you might pick, choose around that boundary, but they're trying to see what would be acceptable. The Japanese had 500 for their limit. We had, as you probably saw, 1,200 because we eat less fish. That made some sense. Uh, what happened in Japan, I think, didn't make sense, caused a lot of concern. As they lowered theirs about uh, April the next year, so a year after the accident, down to 100. You might think that's good. It'll never be zero. There's always going to be some cesium in fish because of what we did in the 60s. Uh, but what that tells the public is that, well, what I ate last year, I should have been eating this year. What's happened? Well, the science didn't change. The health effects aren't known any better for this. But they decided they wanted to have the lowest possible standard to reassure the population that what they were eating was safe, get people to go back to buying fish. So they're making a stricter standard based on almost a political move that really backfired because we don't understand enough to say if 100 is that much better than some other number. It's a risk estimate and very low risk based upon how much you eat. Uh, and in fact, not to go too long, but after Chernobyl, they actually raised some of those limits for products like reindeer in Scandinavia and just said don't eat it very often. You, know, you can have one fish at that level isn't going to cause cancer, and you're trying to pick a number that's low relative to the rates of cancer one in three, one in four people who get cancer. So they're picking some number that's never zero based upon data that are very hard to measure at these low levels 
and trying to use that for health and safety. That's a very difficult decision to do, and people try and stay much lower than that. Thank you for breaking the presentation tonight. Uh, I would like to have you kind of correlate uh, the strontium in your feelings that rather than just the, the fast uh, one that breaks down your, your silicium. Uh, and I would like the audience, it, it's a, it, you're, you're, a, you're an educated off audience, I would like to have you be sure you note the difference between nuclear fission and nuclear fusion uh, as, as you look at uh, problems that are going to be in the ocean because we have to have a, an audience or a public that is acceptable for, for fusion. Yeah, there certainly would be different. You know, this is nuclear fission. These are reactors, traditional reactors that we've used that are fission-based. We do not yet have commercial fusion reactors. If we did, we would not have this issue as we do here for the waste products that come out of that. We have to put those fuel rods somewhere when they're done. We don't have a place for that. There's a very big difference. Uh, but the nuclear energy that's being produced now is all being produced by nuclear fission, produces these radionuclides. The strontium was that you want me to address a bit more. Uh, there are hundreds of radionuclides produced. The most dangerous often are the ones that decay quite quickly, fortunately, but they're producing more radioactive decay events like iodine-131 decays with an eight-day half-life, but iodine bioaccumulates in thyroid, so childhood thyroid cancer rates are of great concern in Japan right now. Strontium, a different isotope, hundreds of times more left in these tanks than was ever released. I'm thinking of things like earthquakes when I worry about what might happen to those tanks if something happened today, and they're only temporary storage tanks. If that were released, it could be a greater event. We wouldn't see that, by the way, for another three or four years. It would be just like this. I'd have a new model, and we would see it in three or four years. But once it's in the ocean, you can't stop it. And once it's in fish, it would remain much longer. That tuna would not lose its strontium as fast as it's losing its cesium. So I think monitoring that carefully uh, is of utmost importance. And when I say decontaminating, uh, you never get rid of these radionuclides. They're there until they decay away. And so all that you can do is concentrate it. Think of like a charcoal filter under your sink. You could take out cesium is what they do now, a process using something called zeolite. It's a clay. And you store that safe, keep people away from that. Uh, you can't ever get rid of it. So that's what they're trying to do desperately with these uh, hundreds of different radionuclides that are still in these storage tanks, somewhat quite high levels, and strontium being one of the ones of greatest health concern to me. Also, a 30-year half-life, so it stays around. Another question over on, on this side? Okay. In your surveys of radioactivity, especially near Fukushima, have you noticed that there is any damage to the commercial fishing stock in those areas? Yeah, that's a, a very good question. You know, had the levels remained in the tens of millions, I think we would have been seeing direct effects in those fish in terms of mortality reproduction, things that are pretty easily to spot. Uh, at the levels we see today, we all we've seen is that because they're not fishing, is the fish stocks are rebounding, actually. So there are more fish in those areas because they've taken off the pressure of fishing. Uh, the types of effects you might see down at these lower levels, I don't know of any studies that I've seen that have reported effects in the ocean. Uh, there are some studies on land of things like insects, butterflies, and some genetic changes due to low-level radioactivity that have yet to be like, corroborated. But there are people looking on land Again, on land, radiation sits there, and so you can be re-exposed many times. In the ocean, the concentrations go down, so it's harder to see in fish uh, and other marine organisms just because they're moving around in waters that get progressively less radioactive versus some of the land-based systems, ecosystems, where they'll be exposed until that cesium decays away to radiation from, say, the soil or the plants that take some of this up, things like that. So it's effects I've seen any sign of uh, are mostly on land in terms of the ecosystem effects. Ken, I noticed on your map that there isn't uh, any citizen program here in Long Beach. Is that something <laughs> you would like to have? Yes, I would challenge this audience and others. If you have a location where you'd like us to make measurements, we're, we're doing this at Scripps now four times a year. I don't think we have to be out there every week. I think we should be monitoring different locations. I'm desperately also trying to get offshore, so get more of those samples to see it before it arrives, but certainly 
I'd love to see a group in Long Beach, you know, close to this aquarium would be great, but we're showing this to actually start putting data points here, not to Scripps Pier, not Point Reyes, but we have no one here yet who's volunteered. Uh, the whole pitch, it's $550. I don't make money off this. We charge that because my lab runs on research grants. It runs on donations from private foundations. We need funding for everything we do. It takes me two days just to concentrate the cesium to a point where I can put it on a detector that's in the basement of a building for another two to three days to measure one sample. It's a labor-intensive and, and expensive process. I could wave a Geiger counter right now and tell you it's not there. That's not what we do in my research lab. So that's the cost. If, if there's anybody here who would be interested in doing that, you should get in touch with me and I'll make a, get in touch with Ken. Are you volunteering? <laughs> Have you contacted Cal State Long Beach about this? It seems like they would be very interested and have the students and the faculty to take this on. I'd love to find the right contact. We've tried at different levels in the federal government. We tried the California Commission. We tried a lot of regional agencies. I have not gone to every single city up and down the coast. We've had a few groups, mostly volunteers, who like the Tillamook Estuary Association, you know, uh, a few Sea Grant programs, but. Yes, if people know of groups that want to participate, that would be great. Uh, my frustration, I think I should say this just to everyone, unless someone mentioned the federal government, uh, we don't have programs in ocean radioactivity specifically. I went to the Department of Energy early on and said, look, you look at radiation effects on land at nuclear waste sites. But as soon as that river or groundwater hits the ocean, it's salty. That's not what they do. They're not an ocean agency. So then you go to... NOAA, National Ocean Atmospheric Administration, they do oceans, they don't do radioactivity. So they point you to another door. You go to the US EPA and they say, well, this is not US territory. If it was in the US, they actually do air and drinking water. So there was a lot of monitoring of air and drinking water, but not the oceans. Uh, NRC is not really a funding agency for this type of science. And so there was really a lot of Sympathy, I'd go down with people, we'd present this to different congressional groups, and they would say, this is great, it's in the national interest, but it's not what we do. And so that was really frustrating. That's made me go back to crowdfunding, go to some of these foundations to say, hey, look, we should be doing something. It's in our interest, even when it's low. And some people say I'm being dismissive because I say it's low. It's, it is what it is. Uh, we should be measuring this because we want to know next time, should this happen again, God forbid, better than within a factor of uh, 10, the amounts that might arrive. Those models differed. I showed you one. A different model would say there's 10 times more or less. Or even within a year of the arrival time. We need to do better than that. We have reactors up and down coastlines around the world. Things might happen. We have reactors and ships. Uh, things happen. And so we need to do better. And that's what uh, motivates me to keep this going, even without that government sponsorship. Cal State Long Beach, uh, as you know, since you met with one of them today, they do monitor kelp and the uptake of right. group wise by in kelp. Right. But if if anybody here would be interested, though, we can make a partnership with Cal State Long Beach and with you. Are you going to volunteer, Jenny? <laughs> <laughs> um, you've mentioned several times that you see much more effects on land than in the ocean. What types of effects did Fukushima have on Japan's terrestrial-based food sources, whether it's produce or livestock, and were there any other terrestrial-based foods in around the world that noticed effects from Fukushima? Well, they've had to stop uh, their local, you know, agriculture for a lot of different products. Early on, it was almost everything was banned, so you couldn't have milk coming from there, you couldn't have rice coming there, fruits, uh, to this day, there are certain uh, cesium in particular is highly enriched in mushrooms. So a lot of the wild mushrooms, commercial mushrooms, still close to this day. They've had to build up an infrastructure to measure cesium at these, what are actually challenging levels. 100 sounds like a big number. It's very difficult to measure 100 becquerels per kilogram. But they're doing it bag by bag for rice. I've seen machines to measure every persimmon that comes out of certain farms before it can go on the market. Even then, it's difficult to convince people that they might want to eat something from this contaminated land. Uh, but that's another challenge, actually. And in fact, there's some <laughs> interesting stories about supermarkets that don't advertise the price, but how many becquerels per kilo is in their products. <laughs> and people go for the lowest one. You know, it's, it's uh, a challenge to get people back with confidence to eat those products, even when they're below this very, very low threshold uh, for cesium.
in particular. Back to the testing program, you said you want four tests a year from each right. site. Each test is five hundred dollars. Right. Five. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, we'll we'll back one of those. Now, from a technical standpoint, you want it offshore. Yes. What about from one of the whale watching tours? Yeah, because that would involve the people on board too in right. a scientific expedition. So <laughs> Val will come up with the money <laughs> off <laughs> off our nightstand. <laughs> and that's a good yeah, because we have daily whale watch cruises, and um, that's a great idea. And and we've been trying to find something useful you for you, Bob, for a long time. So the, the <laughs> all right, we're going to take about all right, Robert. Have you found any correlation between the temperature or depth of the, the cesium moving through the ocean? Well, what we've looked at today are just surface maps. What we find when we do profiles and look deeper is actually the waters that were contaminated off Japan have actually sunk below the surface layer. And instead of being two, it might be up to four or five. Some of those locations, the blue dots that were offshore, uh, I just gave a hard wrap on all the agencies. The National Science Foundation is funding us in a couple of months to look at those different layers systematically in the ocean between a line, a research cruise between Hawaii and Alaska, 20 locations, 12 depths. They'll be getting 240 samples back uh, from that cruise to actually do that type of analysis. So this is when you said temperature, salinity. I'm thinking of water masses getting colder in the winter, sinking down. And indeed, you see some of that. In fact, the goal of that, NSF doesn't fund contaminant monitoring uh, health effects, but they do fund ocean sciences. So the physical oceanographers leading that are trying to understand better the uptake of the ocean of things like carbon dioxide and how deep it would get on short time frames here of four years. So they're using this as what's called tracers in oceanography. So there will be some uh, positive things that might come out of a very horrible situation that is still ongoing in Japan by looking at these distributions, again, even when they're not considered unsafe. But that's a good point. It's not all at the surface. It does mix down. Um, I just recently returned from a, a trip to Japan. And the feeling that I get from the, the general population over there is that the, the Japanese government um, has not been very forthcoming uh, with the, the true results and the extent uh, of the, the problem from Fukushima. And I'm just wondering if you have an opinion uh, regarding the data that's been released by the government. Yes, uh, I actually agree with that sentiment. I've heard it a lot from my Japanese colleagues. Essentially, uh, there's a reluctance in some ways. It's a cultural reluctance to ask for help. They uh, are not forthcoming in that sense. Uh, but also the information they're providing, uh, those red dots of the fish, they were from the fisheries agency, but they'd never put them on a graph to tell the population what did it mean. They would just say, is it higher or lower today? Uh, they're very bad at communicating uh, both what they're spending a lot of money doing and what might be the consequences. Uh, and then there's a lot of mistrust because early on, during the peak of these accidents, during the evacuation, uh, certainly at that time, different parts were not talking to each other. So while one group knew the direction of that fallout on land, people were being evacuated in that direction by another agency. Uh, this whole idea of changing the limit in fish, what does that mean? There was no public discussion that I heard of that, at least to the satisfaction of people I talked to, that said they understood now why last year it was OK to eat fish at 500, and this year it isn't. Uh, very poor job in communication, partly cultural, partly this secrecy in the nuclear power industry, not wanting to admit it's doing anything that might cause harm. Uh, I'll pick on the Prime Minister, Abe, who said it's under control about a year and a half ago. How do you control groundwater? How do you stop flow of water from rain underground into the ocean? You really can't. You can put up a wall, but it will get around that wall, get over that wall. So there are words they're using that even, you know, especially to the Japanese, they just don't understand. And I think they're not being told everything they need to be told, even though they might not be hiding something. I have not seen a lot of lying in terms of the data. The data are results that I actually trust. When I go out with my Japanese colleagues, we get the same results. It's just in translating that and presenting that 
is not being done very well to the public there, who's very concerned, of course, about this. And like I said, can't move back into homes uh, because of some of the data. Uh, so there, there are citizen scientists there. There's a group, SafeCast. I'll give a shout out for them. They are building very cheap Geiger counters that people can carry around so they can monitor their environment, look in the playgrounds, look where they're going back to. And they actually make maps now with uh, hundreds of thousands of data points from hundreds of people with their own Geiger counter on their bicycle, on their car, in their backpack. So uh, as a response to that, people are starting to make measurements sort of like this, sort of like what I hope the surface will do. Uh, that's helping to inform them, but that's quite new for them culturally to be doing that. I think we owe Ken a, a great debt, uh, not only for the research, but for the efforts in public education and outreach to make all of this information available to a very broad public. So, Ken, thank you very much for a great lecture. Thank you. And if you want to go hear a group from Hawaii, all the way from